preparing to live stream the meeting. I think we're live. And we're live. All right. Preparing Welcome. to live stream the meeting. Oops. There we go. It's working. All right. Welcome everybody to the June meeting of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. I think this might be our last Zoom meeting before we get back to in-person events, hopefully. Uh, so um, thanks for joining and, and watching all of these throughout the pandemic. Um, we have a special guest tonight, author Doug Beeren will be talking in a moment, uh, visiting remotely from the Hudson Valley in New York, which is another one of the benefits of doing this over Zoom, which has allowed us to have guests from out of state, out of, out of the country, which has been pretty awesome over the past year. But we are excited about, about getting back to in-person events soon. Um, I just wanted to start off with a couple of announcements and I'll pass it on to others. Um, we have our next meeting is happening in July on July 28th, Wednesday, July 28th. That is to be determined in terms of location, but Brian, can you tell us about the, the speaker and kind of the thoughts behind that meeting? Um, our, our speaker is Justin uh, Luok, and uh, he is a volunteer at Sam Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi in Denver, and he is going to talk about special collections of fungi, how to do it, how to get your uh, collections on iNaturalist connected and the photos and how to get specimens up to the herbarium. This year he's agreed to join the club as a uh, special liaison to the herbarium from the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. And we're very fortunate to have someone who has in direct uh, contact and working directly under uh, Dr. Andy Wilson, the, our state's mycologist uh, stationed there at Sam Mitchell Herbarium at the Denver Botanic Gardens. Awesome. So we're thinking there might be a foray associated with that or an outdoor event of some sort, but we're still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, we're thinking maybe a, a foray in the morning and or uh, early uh, afternoon and then uh maybe an outdoor meeting or a meeting at the library and um we will collect specimens and talk about it from that point of view uh whether or not we get on youtube or not i'm not quite sure with that but um we'll take it as we can and as we go and uh i know i'm looking forward to it because that's how uh, uh we can change the sciences by connecting with the professionals as uh, uh, citizen scientists, that's our link. Yeah, awesome. So uh, more information will be coming soon. So keep an eye on Facebook and email for all of that. Um, so uh, after that, we have a, our August meeting and our September meeting. We'll be back at our at the Bear Creek Nature Center where we have we're holding meetings before um, COVID. But there are two things, exciting things happening in August that I want to remind everyone about. Um, from August 12th through the 15th um, in Granby, Colorado, near Winter Park, it's the uh, annual NAMA foray. Um, there are still tickets available for that for the whole weekend. Um, it's at the Snow Mountain Lodge in Granby, Colorado. There's gonna be lots of speakers, forays, all sorts of stuff, workshops, microscopy workshops. I'm gonna take one of those. Um, so uh, you have to be a NAMA member, an individual NAMA member to be able to go on the foray, to be able to buy a ticket. Uh, there's information on our events page on the website and I can post something in the YouTube chat here in a minute. Um, but uh, in order, if you aren't already a NAMA member, you can get a $5 off of that membership by, if you're a member of PPMS, you can find our club on the dropdown list. I think it's $25 to be a NAMA member for a year. Uh, and it's $20 if you're already a member of PPMS. And then the tickets for that are, are listed. There's lodging possibilities and, and, and a couple different options. I just found out today um, from the NAMA, um, from NAMA that they're now offering a short, a small amount of uh, single day tickets to that. 
So if it was too cost prohibitive or too hard to go for the whole weekend, there, there is an option, they're limited, but uh, for $75, you can go for just Saturday, August 14th. You still have to be a NAMA member, but that includes all the meals for the day, forays and whatever's going on. So um, look, I'll, I'll post a link to that too, but check out the NAMA page for more information on that. And, and those, those will be going fast. So if you're interested in doing that, I would jump on that ASAP. Following NAMA, only a couple days later, from August 18th through the 22nd, is the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride. And that those tickets are uh, limited due to uh, the, the, the capacity limitations, but uh, there are still tickets available for that as well. But I imagine those will probably sell out as well. So get on both of those events if you're interested in, in either or both. So August is a really busy mushroom uh, month because then we come back from Telluride, a couple days later, we have our, our August 25th meeting with Chad Hyatt. Um, that'll be at the Bear Creek Nature Center at 6 p.m. on August 25th. And then September 22nd would be the next meeting. Um, uh, and that is, there's the, more information on the website and we'll tell you about that later, but that's September 22nd at 6 p.m. So mark your calendars. Final announcement from me is that uh, we've added one more item to our online shop. We have patches, PPMS patches. Um, these are kind of limited edition. We had these hand stitched a couple years ago and we didn't, weren't able to get a store together until this year. So, uh, we have, uh, some of these available and they look pretty nice. I've stitched one on a backpack. You can see kind of the size of them here. Um, and, uh, they're a little expensive, uh, you know, in terms of patches cause they were handmade. So they're $15 each, but each patch you buy comes with a free eat more mushrooms bumper sticker. So that's now on the shop on our website. That's all I've got. Uh, I'll pass it on to Alyssa. Hello, my name is Alyssa. I'm the Pikes Peak um, Club Secretary. And I would just like to remind you guys that we have these lovely t-shirts still for sale. We have light gray. This is the back of the, can you see, there we go, of the light gray one. And um, there's also dark gray. This is the, what the front of the shirts look like. Let me see if I can figure out the mirror image here. There we go. Um, that's tough in case you guys have ever tried. Um, anyway, so these are t-shirts available available for sale on our website at pikespeakmike.org slash shop um, for $25. And I'll ship them, just ship them right to you. So you should have it within a couple days of ordering. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me at info at pikespeakmike.org. And um, that's all I've got. So I'll pass, pass it along to Jennifer. Thank you very much, Alyssa. I spoke to our 4A coordinator, James Shaleen, and he thinks that the middle of next week looks really good for a 4A, a club 4A. And you will hear about it on Facebook. And we will send you... If you're a member of the club, you will receive notification in the in your email, and you can sign up for it from there. It should be really good. This is we have been lucky this year. We've got late snow, and lots of rain, and cool days interspersed with hot days. It's hard to imagine a better spring season for this region. Although our hearts go out to those on the western slope where it is kind of dry, but it could change overnight. So there you go. Listen for the uh, exact day and time of the next club foray in the middle of next week. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Hey, I'm Mercedes Perez Whitman. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I'm the co-editor of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society's newsletter with Jessica, who is not with us right now. Uh, but we just put out the um, this month's newsletter on Monday, and it features an article from Alyssa about um, how to make sure you're prepared for a foray um, from, you know, right uh, having the right stuff in your backpack and being hydrated to knowing how to identify snakes really covers a lot of ground. Um, 
then member Anna Wormuth wrote a piece on how to use, how she has used uh, spent mushroom blocks from uh, the local mushroom and microgreen grow called Microvore, that's just here in town, um, and how you can use these blocks for at-home growing and her own uh, process for that. And then there are a lot of foray photos from this year. So thanks to Jessica, because she really put that all together for this month. Um, but as always, we are looking for submissions. So if you'd like to contribute, you can send uh, your contribution to editor at pikespeakmike.org, or you can uh, get in contact with me um, through Facebook or email, um, whatever works for you. Should I, You're did sure. anyone else wanna get into anything? I think just one thing, we had a question about forays and as you know, Jennifer was mentioning, all of our forays are always um, weather dependent and every year is totally different. Um, and so keep an eye out. We can't really plan things ahead of time. We do a lot of scouting, Jennifer, Brian, everybody's scouting. Uh, James is scouting a lot, Alyssa. So um, we're keeping an eye out on weather conditions. And then when we think that there's good conditions for a foray, uh, we announce that it's not always that far ahead of time. So we post information on Facebook as well as email. So paid members get the information via email, but on Facebook, we usually say, hey, there's a foray coming up on whatever day, check your email. So that's how we can get the word out on that, but it's not always uh, really with uh, so much advance notice, but we are doing a midweek foray next week, uh, date to be determined, but uh, trying to, split up the weekend and weekday for us to get other, you know, more people, more options to go. But yeah, I think Mercedes, you can introduce Doug now. Yeah, we are lucky to host Doug Bieren today. Um, a friend that I met at the 2019 Telluride Mushroom Festival when uh, he gave me and Anna a ride to um, kind of an ongoing micro-remediation project there that um and that they were checking in on uh them being mainly i think trad cotter and leaf olson um and then we reconnect at new moon mycology summit later that uh later that month and then the next month you came back to colorado uh to check out some mycological things for your book and checked out what I was working on in my house and selling at the Colorado Farm and Art Market. We even came to a West Side Community uh, Center to check out their composting operation by Soil Cycle. It's a very fun and fruitful uh, uh, time. And I'm glad that we've maintained contact and it's been fun to see uh, your book drop because I remember, I think the last time I saw you, you were a little uh, stressed about it and it came out beautifully. So that must be relieving. Um, and yeah, I'll just do a little short bio and then we'll dive right into the talk. So Doug Bieren is a freelance journalist writing about science and technology, food and education and the various ways they point to a more equitable and sustainable world. His byline appears in Wired, The Atlantic, Vice, Motherboard, The Counter, Outside Magazine, Civil Eats, and numerous other publications. So thank you so much for joining us, Doug. Um, also, we will have a Q&A at the end. So I'll be checking YouTube comments uh, for people tuning in if they have any questions or comments for Doug and be sure to uh, relay that to him. So yeah, thanks, Doug. And Take it away. <laughs> well, thanks Mercedes for such a nice introduction. And yeah, I'm glad that we've stayed in touch and you were there now that you mentioned it. It's funny to think you were there at three separate stages of my reporting process for this book. And uh, you got to see the stress levels increase each time, I think. So um, yeah, I'm relieved that it's been well received. At least I'll leave it to other people to say how it turned out. But um, thank you everyone for being here and for having me um, really just, excited and honored to be uh, invited to speak with you. I was originally thinking I would read 
an excerpt from the book, but um, the excerpt I would have chosen basically goes over kind of why mushrooms and fungi are interesting, what they have to teach us, and kind of the the character of the community that I'll that I interacted with and, and tried to document in the book. Um, but I figure that that's stuff that a lot of you are already familiar with. So instead of that preamble, I'll give you this preamble to a slideshow um, of photos I was taken throughout the reporting trip, obviously including several from Colorado, um, that will take us on a little bit of a visual tour of the themes and locations and some of the characters. Um, so I just wanna confirm that you can see that. Do you see that uh, cover slide? All right, great. All right, so in search of Mycotopia, um, I, uh, I'm excited to share this uh, because it's uh, throughout the trip, I was taking these photos and, and none of them made it into the book. It's a photo free book. Um, so this is sort of a, an extra dimension that I get to introduce people to. Um, hopefully it adds some color. Uh, so in search of Mycotopia, um, I'll start just by kind of characterizing, I guess, what I'm, what that title means or, or what it alludes to. And um, it's sort of the theme that emerged for me as I was writing the book, which is, um, you know, we hear a lot about mushrooms saving the world. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of the interest that's being generated about around fungi these days, I think is uh, motivated by the sense that they can save us and that they offer a lot of um, applications, um, insights, examples, uh, means of kind of cleaning up our mess uh, on this planet. And I think that's true to a large extent. There, there's an immense promise. Um, but I was starting to find as I, as I started documenting and, and traveling among these communities that there was a certain kind of set of values that, that seemed to also emerge alongside this renewed and, and modern kind of growth of interest in mycology. And, and that became kind of the most interesting part of it to me. So with that said, um, some of these, like I mentioned before, will not be new to everybody here, but uh, you may recognize that truck. You may recognize the man in the hat um, as uh, Art Good Times. This is, of course, the Telluride Mushroom Festival um, 2019, which is, as Mercedes mentioned, when I uh, met her and was really the kind of the beginning of this whole reporting trip for me. And this is also, I think, what a lot of people might imagine when they hear the term mushroom culture. Um, it's, you know, pretty on the nose. There's a kind of hippie dimension to it, uh, shroomers. Um, there's an emphasis in, in, at Telluride on, um, the entheogenic, um, med medicinal sort of di dimension of fungi, um, their culinary, you know, dimensions and the foraging of them is a huge part of it as well, um, among other things. Like they also talk a lot about remediation and a lot of the kind of applied mycology stuff that has a lot of people excited these days. But I think it, it marked it marked for me at least a sort of bridge between a, a a culture that has been engaging with fungi and mushrooms in a certain way for a while, and kind of contrasted and and led to or, or or represented part of a spectrum with this other more modern, younger, more diverse, more socially conscious kind of dimension of mycology that the book ends up being uh, largely about. So speaking of foraging. Um, Usually in this talk, I'll be discussing how mushrooms are sort of, um, I mean, they're like beacons. They, they draw our attention and they um, call us to look closer at the ground and into rotting logs, into, you know, up, uh, you know, to the heights of the trees. And uh, I also share this because it, it, they, they seem to have a certain, um, they seem to, to offer a certain invitation to discover more about them. And I certainly felt that. And this was at Telluride when I, I, I went there, I, I went with the intention of finding an Amanita muscaria because they had taken on a, a real significance for me symbolically. And I thought that would really be the, uh, the right way to start this experience off. And sure enough, on my first foray, I found this beautiful Amanita. So um, yeah, I always like to share that. There's some other aspects of the culture there that I found pretty amusing. The, the, uh, I often share this because it, is funny <laughs> to me, but a lot of people are pretty serious about this um, theory that uh, the spores of mushrooms, of fungi, originated from outer space. Um, and here they are implying that there's a conspiracy to cover it up. I think it's pretty tongue in cheek, but 
Um, I've heard a lot of people articulate this, and uh, I often take this opportunity to say that uh, I personally find it much more profound to consider uh, fungi as relatives of ours, um, as earthly as us, um, which of course is what the science uh, tells us is the case. But um, all that is to set up what my introduction to fungi actually looked like. This was in Rochester, New York, um, when I made my visit to Smugtown Mushrooms for an article I was writing about uh, this mushroom company that had a, a pretty interesting kind of ethos that was trying to make its business work despite not being the most uh, competitive capitalist enterprise that you would find, much more community oriented, um, uh, led by Olga Sogas on the right there. And, um, you know, I was immediately sort of introduced to this world, like feet first, just right in um, as a as a newbie, essentially. I had been introduced to Paul Stamets' TED Talk that many of you have probably seen, and I had even interviewed him. I was pretty curious about all this, but this was when I, I first entered into an environment uh, dedicated to cultivating mushrooms. There was obviously a certain kind of punk aesthetic to it. Um, here's Olga's lab, which you can see is kind of cobbled together flow hoods and, and um, you know, just like office supplies on top of it. And it's a, uh, it's kind of a, a, a funky scene, you might say. And, and so I, I found it instantly um, enticing and, and interesting and, and fun to, to explore. Um, all of that, of course, is next to just the fungi themselves, which were um, kind of a revelation to me. And on the left there, you'll see the, uh, the uh, autoclave, uh, which is basically a giant pressure vessel to uh, sterilize the substrate that the fungi end up uh, consuming as they uh, begin to make mushrooms. So I'm trying to tune what I say, by the way, just to make sure that I don't cover ground that I'm certain everybody is already uh, conscious of. So forgive me if some of this is uh, not news to you, but um, for me, it certainly was. I had never been in a room like this before with that just surrounded by fungus and the smells of oyster mushrooms and lion's mane mushroom and reishi that smells that have come to be very familiar to me and also very kind of beloved. I, I, I have a lot of emotional attachment to those smells now. Um, it was all hitting me at once. And this wasn't even that big an operation. This is, uh, I think about 200 pounds a week, which is nothing compared to what you would see in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, but it was enough to keep this community going and this business going and um, it's all volunteer run. Um, I don't like to kind of speak for the, the worldview or politics or anything of the people that I'm, uh, you know, writing about, but I think there was a definite kind of anarchist vibe, a definite kind of anti-capitalist vibe um, in these spaces. And, you know, I don't think you need to be a, you know, uh, an expert on uh, sociology to kind of pick that up. But um, the emphasis on community over profit was something that really struck stuck with me and it gets to those values I alluded to earlier, um, as does the idea of turning waste into resource. Um, these are spent grains from a brewery next door. And so that was another thing that I was learning about fungi in real time is that they turn outputs into inputs and kind of call into question concepts of waste and why we waste anything if we don't have to. So, um, all of this was pretty profound for me, but it really clicked. Uh, I, I got the mushroom message loud and clear um, when we went on our foray, my first foray, um, Olga's umpteenth. But uh, with her guidance, you know, as someone who hikes a lot and has spent a lot of time outdoors, um, I'm from the desert originally, but um, you know, I live in the woods now and I spend a lot of time in the woods. I had never really tuned into the fungal frequency before. And with her guidance and expertise, I started to get my eyes, as they say, and spot mushrooms um, that I had never heard of or imagined before. I was introduced to the um, the uh, artist conch, Ganoderma aplanatum, which again, many of you are probably very aware of what it does, but you can draw on it. A mushroom you can draw on with your finger. How cool is that? Um, it might've been a waste because uh, more artistically inclined person would probably have made better use of it, but um, lion's mane growing out of the, the side of a tree, um, which 
you know, now I would find even more incredible than I did then because I love Lion's Mane now and I, I recognize its its value on a number of levels. And back then, it was just this crazy pom pom looking thing growing out of a woodpecker hole, and we took it home and ate it. And so there was this sense of abundance that started to to emerge around fungi for me. Um, and this is something I, I tend to say. Uh, I find myself saying this a lot, pointing it out that like all of this I think is part of just. And we were talking about it earlier too. It's related, I think, to um, recognizing for the first time something that's ubiquitous, that's um, fundamental to life as we know it, um, that, and yet uh, is well outside of our consciousness or most of our consciousnesses, you know, here in the United States at least. And you know, I'll I'll, I'll mention that if you walk into a forest and you don't see the plants or you don't see the animals, you're missing a pretty big part of the forest, and it's no less true with fungi, but um, just by their nature and maybe for some cultural reasons, we tend to overlook them. So uh, all of that was a pretty profound experience for me. Um, the florist four lit up like a pinball and my sense of mm, the natural world around me was forever transformed. Um, it's always a good time to smell a mushroom, of course. Uh, and it's kind of funny to some people, but uh, now I fully understand that it's a, a key part of the, uh, the sort of relationship that we form with mushrooms and the sense of fellowship that kind of comes from that relationship. Um, so all that aside, back to Smugtown's uh, warehouse, where they're preparing to uh, go to Kennett Square, which is called the mushroom capital of the world, but really should be called the uh, mushroom capital of North America because uh, China uh, outdoes everybody else on earth when it comes to mushroom production, as far as I understand it. So um, but this is obviously not going to compete with any of the major farms. They were heading to a farmer's market and hustling to make it work as a uh, small independent mushroom cultivator. And this was in 2015. Um, I think nowadays there's a lot more of a market for this, of these so-called specialty mushrooms, oysters, lion's mane, rishi, and so on. Um, there's more producers, there's more consciousness about it. Um, so hopefully not as much need for folks like Olga to, to drive across state lines just to sell mushrooms. But, uh, you know, I haven't asked recently. Um, so here's another step of my own personal kind of journey into fungal fellowship, taking home mushrooms to, to grow on our kitchen sink. Um, these are reishi that came from, uh, from Olga. And actually Olga's sources are reishi from a, a strain that she picked up at a public park, I believe, near a bench. Uh, in Rochester. She works as much as she can with local strains. Another one of these values uh, that I keep talking about. Um, and I also like to tell people that if, if ever anyone is curious about fungi or is looking to learn more about them, I, I, I highly recommend just getting a grow kit, sharing space with the, this unfamiliar but fundamental organism. You may hear a train in the background, forgive me. Um, it's kind of like a house plant that you can eat or make medicine from. Um, and inevitably, I ended up growing my own. Um, I went to a horse training facility in Jamaica Bay, Queens, uh, got a bunch of straw, um, sterilized it in my backyard, and uh, started growing mushrooms. And these uh, oysters started poking out the very day that I signed the deal for the book. So um, I took that, again, as a good omen. And uh, they always seem to know somehow mushrooms, but, uh, and yes, I did eat them. Um, so all of that's basically just to set up how I came into contact with this stuff. Um, some of the, the, you know, reasons that I found it alluring. And from then on, I was off and, and, you know, trying to learn about them. And here I am visiting a, a spot in Colorado that some of you may be familiar with, uh, this formerly, unfortunately, Front Range Fungi. Um, I don't believe they, uh, they made it through the COVID period, but this was in 2019, I think. And that is uh, Trevor Garifano, who was running it at the time. Um, and this is one of the examples in the book of just kind of the many ways that mushroom cultivation can uh, look, the many, the form, the, one of the many forms it can take. And in this case, it's uh, the form of two trailer trucks that had been converted. Um, the one on the left was the uh, lab and incubation section, and the right one was the fruiting chamber where the, the mushrooms would grow. And you can see they, uh, they had a little shoot 
installed between the two. They cut holes in the side of the sides of the trailers and could just like pirate ships, you know, pass bags from one to the other. Um, eventually it spilled over into the hallway of this abandoned building that they had posted up next to. Um, so this is part of the, to me, it was a, a cool example of just the sort of scrappy, make it work, portable, adaptable nature of, of this um, form of farming. And it also happens to produce a lot of, well, uh, waste in quotes, spent blocks in quotes, uh, because these you know, were used to grow two, maybe three flushes of mushrooms and they're tossed out just economically that that they call it biological efficiency you know the amount of weight of mushrooms you get per pound of substrate uh, at a certain point it, it, the yields taper off and it's just not economically viable you, you start with a new block but these blocks remain viable in other ways perfectly good for growing mushrooms and in fact um the uh and not just as compost you know you can you can grind them up and put them in a garden and, and build soil but you can also um continue to grow mushrooms from them. And uh, now I'm trying to tune this because uh, I would be talking about Mercedes as though she weren't here, but she is here. And uh, here are mushrooms that with her company, uh, Myco Springs, um, you know, as part of their, the work that she does is to utilize mycelium, uh, utilize spent substrate, spent substrate in uh, gardening and landscaping. And these mushrooms in these bowls came from the landscaping she had done at her own uh, home. And they sold, as I recall, every single one of those at the, uh, at the uh, farmer's market there. Um, so value add, adaptability, reducing waste, all things that I can get behind. Um, and moving up in scale, as far as mushroom farming goes, um, the, uh, oh, and I should say that, that those spent substrate blocks that were used for the, for, for the Myco Springs um, project came from uh, came from that the, 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 that pair of trailer trucks, but since they are no longer in business, I've been informed that now Microvora is the source of the the blocks for for those gardening projects and landscaping projects. Um, this is Myco Terra in Massachusetts. We're jumping over a few state lines. Um, the largest mushroom company in Massachusetts, for, uh, founded and run by Julia Coffee. Um, it's that's another autoclave and you just give you a sense of the scale of these things obviously operating at a lot a larger scale than um smug town or uh, front range fungi um i think it was about 2500 pounds a week um which is still minuscule compared to um pennsylvania which is like hundreds of millions of pounds a year um you know all farms accounted for it but um these are some of the mushrooms they were growing there. Black pearl is a really cool up and coming specialty mushroom. Um, and yeah, so at that level, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a full on business and you're, you're operating as a farm basically, but sliding down the scale uh, in the other direction to the extreme and also going to the other side of the country to, uh, and actually another country to uh, Vancouver, Canada, we meet, uh, Willoughby Aravalo, who is kind of the, the ultimate um, example of DIY mushroom cultivation. He even wrote a book called DIY Mushroom Cultivation, which I highly recommend people check out um, if you're uh, interested in growing mushrooms at home. And uh, he's the master or maybe committed student of uh, low-tech, no-tech cultivation. Um, by the way, that's lion's mane as well. And you can see the mycelium inside this jar of liquid culture has uh, coalesced and attempted to reach the uh, lid. And uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think about that. It even looks like a mushroom cloud a little bit. Um, but uh, liquid culture, by the way, is a kind of fungal nutrient broth that uh, contains fragments of living mycelium that kind of spring into action as soon as they are introduced into a substrate. And it's become a really popular way of working with fungi, um, cultivating, spreading them around, doing all sorts of projects with them in a really reliable, uh, easy to accomplish, high standard of sterility, um, you know, form. So more and more people in the kind of radical mycology, you know, in quotes, um, and literally in the explicit radical mycology community, um, it's kind of its own brand and, and world we'll get there in a minute. Um, you, know, you see a lot of liquid culture uh, projects being uh, 
developed. And I love the the bespoke kind of improvised nature of, of this stuff. You can see like a marble is being used as an agitator. I like that it says has bacteria on it too. You, you just wanted to see what it would do. Um, but uh, you can be, be a mushroom farmer in your, your apartment, you know, your, your one bedroom apartment. This is the incubation chamber slash uh, water heater. Um, this is the shower slash uh, fruiting chamber. <laughs> um, this is uh, from uh, Willoughby's book as well. But um, it's not all basements and greenhouses and bathrooms. It's also a serious science, mycology. So we're going to jump over another uh, border to the UK. This is the uh, Fungarian at Kew Gardens in London. It's the largest Fungarian in the world, as far as I've been told. Um, something like 2 million species of fungi and slime molds. Um, each of those box, boxes contains a specimen and there are aisle after aisle of those uh, just like that and they're movable. Um, and this is what the science of fungal taxonomy, of all taxonomy really comes down to. It's a collection of specimens that can be um, uh, referenced to compare and contrast you know, other specimens and to ultimately get a picture of how they relate and um, to tell us how they evolved and, and what order and where. Um, but that is a process that's, and we'll get to that in a minute as well, taking on uh, a new dimension as genetic sequencing reveals relationships between fungi and all sorts of other organisms that the, uh, just looking at them, you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily uh, uh, deduce. Um, so just a couple other cool things from Q. This is the Citerius darwini or Darwin's fun fungus found in uh, Tierra del Fuego. And you can see his signature on that slip of paper down there. Um, they have a, uh, a few interesting specimens like this ascomycete that eats bone. Um, and it's the sheath that's around the horn there of that ram skull. Um, marmite, of course, you see in the corner there is based on uh, a yeast and uh, as is beer and all sorts of other, um, you know, common products that we all enjoy every day. Um, and part of the, the process of introducing people to fungi, I found, is just reiterating and making sure it's clear just how universal they are, not just in nature, but in our lives and the things that we use, medicines we rely on, food we eat, everything, we, uh, a lot of the things we drink. Um, another cool specimen, a, a very... Uh, gnarly looking uh, cordyceps growing out of a caterpillar of some sort. There's even a drawer of slime molds, which I found totally uh, fascinating. Um, I also love that they are called, uh, they're not fungi slime molds, as, as many of you will know, but they were often uh, kind of lumped together, confused with them. They were even called myxomycetes or mycetozoa, which is literally a uh, like fungus animal. Um, owing to their ability to move and their apparent kind of intelligence. Um, and this is a, just for anyone interested, what a, what a, a type specimen looks like. It's sort of the, the ground level of that morphological comparison that I was mentioning earlier. It's the, uh, the ultimate reference for the species that it names. So um, I would zoom in and tell you what the name of that is, but I can't right now. So um, moving on again. Another country, this country, we're back in California. Um, this is Danielle Stevenson at UC Riverside in Southern California, where she's, I think still, or, or recently finished working on her PhD, studying uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which are uh, the type that enter the cells of plants in their roots and form symbiotic relationships that uh, kind of attenuate their relationship to the soil around them, facilitates the exchanges of nutrients, fends off uh, threats from other microbes, other fungi. And they also have a lot for those, those capacities and others, uh, they have a lot of promise for agricultural um, applications. And that is actually what UC Riverside started as a, an agricultural research station. So it um, makes a lot of sense to be studying them, but it's also an example um, of how little they've been studied. Um, you know, they've been known about for a long time, but the, the capacities they have, the ways they might be utilized is uh, it's just becoming um, 
uh, a subject of study of intensive, more intensive study. And just for a sense of, of the scale here, I, I thought this was amazing. She showed me, I think that's a tomato plant, might not be, but uh, the root of the plant is that giant brown column and the hyphal thread is that blue thread coming out of the side there. Um, give you a sense of just how much smaller the hyphal thread is than the, the roots and that uh, explains how it's able to uh, uh, multiply the surface area of the root and facilitate much greater nutrient absorption uh, than they would have without it. Um, all of this is a far cry from how we often are told to assess fungi or kind of conditioned to assess fungi, which generally is as uh, pathogen, uh, pathogenic or uh, as a threat, especially to plants um, in Utah. I was visiting uh, with uh, Bryn Dentinger, who you'll see in a second, and uh, his class at the University of Utah, um, where I was introduced to uh, bark beetles and the work of the bark beetles specifically. I didn't meet a bark beetle, but I could see what they do. And um, big swaths of trees had, had just been kind of sickened by, by this process. And the guy I was with um, mentioned that you know, it's not the beetle that kills the tree. It's actually the fungus that they carry. And indeed, those beetles do carry a lot of fungi with them in, in relationships that are really kind of amazing. Often they're so specialized that the beetle will have a specialized pocket in its exoskeleton that sort of nurtures the spores of the fungus uh, in between trees so that they can kind of care, almost like, like they're nursing the fungi on their way to their next tree. Um, in the book, I talked to Dr. Diana Six about how it's probably not the fungus that's actually killing the tree in most cases. And actually this might represent a process that, you know, you know fingers crossed uh, that, that will lead to more resilient forests because as the climate's changing, we're seeing more of these beetles and the trees that they don't leave behind or rather the trees that they don't eat that they leave behind may be genetically um, equipped to withstand the conditions and, and for whatever reason, not to be uh, attractive to the, the beetles. So here's hoping, but in the book, it's meant as an example of how much more complicated the pictures of ecological interactions are than what we tend to think. And especially when it comes to something like fungi, which we've been, again, kind of trained to view as a threat, as a problem, something to be managed or eliminated. Um, and that's probably, owing largely to a lack of education. And so, um, you know, I mean, we don't, even science, you know, even even the, the even an institution like Q, which has so many fungi in its holdings, and, and this is a, you know, it's, it's a maturing science, but it, it's not just emerging out of nowhere. A lot has been learned about fungi, but we still don't know how many exist. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what we're losing. I say we as though I'm a scientist, I'm not, but, um, you know, we, the interested people in, in fungi, um, and that includes scientists. Um, at this point, it's estimated that something like under 10% of the, of, I think just mushroom producing species uh, have been identified. So there's a lot to learn and good reason to, because they're fundamental to ecologies, to forest health. Um, they're worth protecting and, and understanding and um, that's what Bryn Dentinger on the right there is, is working to do with his students here. Um, this was part of a collection effort. Um, it was a class, like a field trip, but the, um, the holdings of fungi at the University of Utah were basically non-existent when Bryn got there. So he started the fungarium for them and in an effort to fill it <laughs> and to document the local fungal, um, he is recruiting students and into the effort and trying to work with local enthusiast groups and amateurs. And that's how it's gotta be done. And I'm sure a lot of you have been in, involved in the uh, fundus uh, fungal distribution project and, uh, and its predecessor, um, the name of which escapes me. But the link between the institutional sciences and citizen scientists, amateurs, again, in quotes, because, you know, Amateur. I've heard that the roots of it are to do something out of love, and I can't really 
find a reason to be mad at that. Um, but it, it gets a bad rap being an amateur, but it turns out it, it doesn't mean you can't make a contribution, you know, to the sciences or anything else, um, which is a theme that comes up in the book. Um, so those are some mushrooms that they found. And here is the fungarium at the university of, it's actually at the natural history museum of Utah, which is, um, related to the university, but, uh, that long hallway you see there is not the fungarium itself. That just leads to it. That's everything they have. The fungarium is just that closet that uh, Bryn has opened up there. And you can see it's it's pretty scant compared to um, what you saw at Q. And he actually used to be the head of mycology at Q, incidentally. So it's kind of a funny um, connection. But this is the other side of it. People, the science scientists and in this, people in the science uh, community who are trying to do important work are finding, you know, resources are more limited. This is a subject that not everyone knows about. It's often maligned, even among uh, the, the natural sciences. It's behind in a lot of ways. So it's got, it, it, it's got a kind of uh, some catching up to do essentially. And um, it's happening at the time that the genetic revolution has been, you know, gaining steam as, as metagenomics, uh, um, phylogenetics, the ability to find genetic information in, in all kinds of samples of organic matter and then to compare you know to target fungi in that sample and to compare what you find with everything else you find and start building a picture or a phylogeny of of the relationships is, is a pretty um, astounding development it's really complicating the picture but it's deepening and enriching it too the picture of um, the relationships of all these beings and this is what the phylogeny that uh, Bryn was looking uh, working at on looks like if you uh, unfurl it. Interestingly, this is um, about Bolites in the uh, southwest coast of Africa and the east coasts of um, South America, I believe. And the idea is that they're looking for uh, what, uh, relationships that might suggest the mushrooms on one coast are related to the mushrooms on the other because the continents used to be connected in ancient history. And so that's a, that's a pretty cool um, concept in my opinion. Speaking to the citizen science thing, um, this is a, an example of, of the future, I think, and it's probably even outdated by now, but it's by Oxford Nanopore, I think is the name of the company. And it's a pocket-sized genetic sequencer. And essentially it means that the work that's being done in major scientific institutions and labs uh, can, can be done, you know, at a pretty good degree of accuracy and quality in the field, in the forest. Um, and this is how those partnerships is, are becoming part, uh, possible between, you know, the institutions and the amateurs and how they become, they're, they've been fruitful. It's not just go pick some mushrooms and send it to the, you know, you guys go get mushrooms in the field and bring it back to the scientists in their ivory tower or whatever. Um, it's not like that. It's a very collaborative thing, and it gives the people, in, you know, who aren't doing this stuff for a living, a real sense of participation and 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 contribution. And they're learning themselves, and they just, you know, people who like to pick mushrooms are going to do it anyway. Um, and for the scientists, it makes possible collection efforts that they might not have the resources to undertake otherwise. So it's a really fruitful um, partnership. Um, and it's kind of an echo of how the, the mycology sciences emerged in the first place in the UK in particular, uh, you know, as part of the naturalist boom of the, the Victorian era and um, plants uh, especially got uh, a lot of attention in that period among, you know, all sorts of other things. But um, Bryn Dentinger, uh, again, who's been showing us all of this, uh, put it to me that mycology is in its own Victorian era now, um, kind of the genetic sequencing taking the role of the microscope, uh, you know, in, in our respective eras. Um, and I just like to show this because I think it's funny. This was on his wall. Um, and he did kind of strike me as like a mycological fox molder. So um, we're going to move now, I guess, into some remediation uh, conversation and also uh, picking back, piggybacking on the education piece because um, so much of what I see saw and still see in these spaces is oriented at educating people, um, kind of moving them up the ladder of engagement from curiosity to fascination, maybe to obsession. Um, it seems like a natural trajectory, um, but the key is just to get people engaged with this stuff. And here uh, I am visiting the uh, uh, North Texas Myco Alliance, or I think it's now the Central Texas Myco Alliance. 
um, at the Circle Acres remediation site just outside of Austin. Um, and again, a bunch of spawn blocks. I don't think these are uh, quote unquote spent, but um, they were being used as part of the education uh, of this community. People just showing up curious about mushrooms and to learn about it, get a hands-on um, experience with them. But this site, and there's Daniel Reyes, who, who sort of runs the, the operation there, um, is dedicated. It's actually a former dump um, that they're remediating, um, highly polluted. There's been a lot of work done there to clean it up, and mushrooms are playing a key role in that. Um, so they bring people in, teach them how to, you know, teach them what fungi are, all the basics. There's a certain, uh, there's some beats to to the, you know, the classes that you'll find are consistent everywhere you go. And then, um, you know, they actually start working with them, and then that is factored into the, you um, remediation effort. So it's kind of an example and also an instance of the, uh, the potential of mushrooms to be um, soil builders, to break down contamination. Your wine caps are being used are very common in garden beds as a soil building uh, mushroom and um, they also produce tasty mushrooms. Um, and cardboard, again, you know, a reduction of waste is kind of uh, inherent in this because you can take cardboard and throw it away or recycle it, or you can turn it into food for fungus and it becomes soil or compost. And, you know, I know which one I think is uh, is the better uh, use of old cardboard. Um, yeah, again, turning waste into something else, into something useful. Um Again, just jarring. We're, we're going across the country again. Here we are in New York and Brooklyn, actually, with uh, Craig Trester of Biotech Without Borders. Um, and I kind of use this slide just to, to suggest that, again, this is something that uh, I'm seeing and, and you can see everywhere you go in this country and, and beyond, um, a kind of unofficial fungal pedagogy that's emerging. And you'll get these people like just like in Texas, um, just as I'm sure you've you know seen uh, plenty of examples of there. You see it at uh, Telluride for sure. Um, people who are just curious, they've heard that mushrooms have a lot to offer or are interesting for various reasons. And then they show up and um, they are shown a certain series of things like what fungi are, their biology, their ecology, their roles in, in, you know, nature. And then gradually we move on to their many potential applications. Um, the, you know, once you've learned about their reproductive cycle and, and the way they feed and, and, you know, what they kind of do for nature, then you start to learn about cultivating them. Um, you start to learn about how they might be useful in, again, preventing crop disease or maybe preventing disease. People are exploring their medicinal aspects, breaking down contaminants, filtering waterways, uh, the basis of biomaterials like these, um, which I saw at the uh, uh, Art and Design of Fungi show in a very um, posh gallery in London. Um, so it's it's getting a lot of traction. These are more, I think, interesting for the kind of conceptual example. I don't think anyone wear those shoes, but uh, there are some incredible um, and highly refined, like just uh, like high tech versions of this stuff being done by companies like MycoWorks and Ecovative. And so the mycomaterials thing is a real um, interesting part of it. And it's just one of those things that will come up in these classes that, um, yeah, seem to be meeting a growing demand, I think, for just learning about fungi and finding out among different people whether they can, whether or how they can interact with them productively. And there's always an answer to that. Like, you know, whether it's just going out into the woods and finding them and sort of communing with nature or whether you're going to start a business around them, you know, um, I think everyone kind of finds their niche within this subject and it ends up being about a lot more than mushrooms. And um, yeah, speaking of remediation and all of that, um, here we are again in Colorado. And some of you may know uh, Jeff Ravage, um, that's him. And uh, this is us in uh, Conifer, I believe. Um, as part of a project of the uh, Coalition for the Upper South Platte to uh, use, I, I don't need to tell anyone here probably, the, the situation with wildfires um, around you and the uh, you know intensifying uh, nature of them uh, in recent years and the 
just devastating results of these crown fires that basically sterilize the environment and you know kill all of the life in the soil obviously destroy the trees and so part of the project uh that cusp is was undertaking uh was to encourage logging that would lead to the forest that better resembled the kind of mosaic pattern that it used to um, exemplify, which was more fire resistant and was the result of, um, you know, nature and also stewardship by indigenous communities that that knew how to, to kind of operate um, with, in, in relationship with nature in a way that wouldn't lead to results that we see now. At least that's what I've been led to, to think. Um, I'm no expert on these things, but um, in any case, they're trying to get back to literally the picture of the forest. They're using old photographs to assess what kinds of tree distributions there used to be. And as part of the logging process, it's generating a lot of these wood chips. And the idea is that if they can inoculate the wood chips with wood rotting fungi, um, local strains within 30, no more than 100 miles of the site, then it will turn it into compost. Um, accelerate the decomposition process and kickstart, accelerate the rebounding of life in these fire damaged zones. And um, the I go into the details of the findings of this five-year project in the book, but um, the results were pretty compelling. You know, this is just from right under the surface of dry uh, pellets that are uh, chips, wood chips that, um, you know, they stay dry on the surface. No bacteria or fungi is likely to break them down, but just underneath you get this um, after just a few years. And next to this plot was a control plot, not right next to it. Otherwise I would have photographed them together, but um, it was the control plot that had not been inoculated. And it was four or five feet taller than the massive one that we're standing on here. So that and a lot of other evidence really suggests that it works. I'm not sure what plans are for rolling it out. You really have to do it at a large scale for it to be meaningful, but um, you know, the fungi are doing their thing. Those are those are oyster mushrooms popping up from um, from the wood chips. And uh, Jeff was really happy that a, a bear hadn't already beaten him to them. And um, again, it's always a good time to sniff a mushroom. Um, here's his lab again for some of the sort of uh, you know homebrew nature of this uh, whole thing. Just sourcing fungal strains from wherever you know he might find them. Um, mushroom fe uh, fung fungus festivals. Um, I think just finding them in the woods, finding them eating uh, uh, certain types of trees, you know, take them home, cultivate them, see, see what you can do to, to propagate them. And then he was working with uh, mile high fungi nearby to uh, use their autoclave and their, their lab to like really do it at scale for these projects. Um, so that's some of the practical uh, side of this, but, um, you know, we'll start slipping into the more kind of um, values laid inside here. Um, this is a schizophyllum commune that I found at Circle Acres in Texas. And it's the first one I ever found. And it's here because it's an example of a fungus that uh, challenges binaries, um, some would say. it's uh, It's got over 23,000 mating types, and it's been taken up by many as a symbol of the sort of uh, subversive potential of fungi um, and their challenge to our concepts, again, of binaries, of, of individuality, of you know, value, of waste. Um, that kind of moves us to the fermentation side where here we are in Short Mountain, Tennessee with Sandor Katz in the center there. If you couldn't tell, he's a, a fermentation revivalist. Um, and he does these five-day workshops where people from all over the world come to learn and learn about fermentation, but also to share about fermentation, which often involves bacteria, but also fungi. And there's a lot I could say about this, but the basic uh, lesson for me in this experience was was that fermentation is a, is a is a process that carries a lot of metaphorical value, and it represents um, you know, an exchange of information, an exchange, uh, a free exchange, to the extent that I came to view this room as a fermentation vessel. And uh, it really it was a pretty powerful experience for everyone involved. It was powerful in part because I got to make my tempeh for the first time, speaking of fungus. Um, this is straight out of the uh, 
incubator. It hasn't been cooked yet, so it's still alive in my hands. In Tennessee, it turns out, is a there's an interesting history about tempeh in Tennessee uh, in the 70s, kind of being introduced to the United States by way of a bunch of hippies at the farm. Um, so tempeh, Tennessee, there's a connection there that I get into in the book. Um, this is a stained glass window of botulism <laughs> that gives you a sense of the, the values system at play here. We really um, working with microbes in this sphere and, and treating them as partners, you know, not as pathogens um, in the process of sharing information that people could form their own businesses from instead of like guarding it and trying to sell it to the other person, you know, it's being freely exchanged and um, it's being done to preserve food, to extend its life, you know, um, enhance its flavor value, its nutritional value. The, the idea that these, you know, non-acquisitive open and, and collaborative spaces could generate that much value and everyone would benefit was basically the, the takeaway for me. Um, and it's something that's so simple, you know, mushroom cultivation takes, takes effort and you got to really control for certain conditions and stuff, but fermenting is just, you know, if you're making a sauerkraut or something, it's just a matter of soaking something under its own fluids and letting it sit for a while, letting the microbes do their work. So I'm not the only one who noticed that there's some social dimension to these ideas. Um, this is Sandor's wall and you can see foment, fermentation, pickle your damn self. I will ferment myself. Um, there's, there's a real connection between one's sense of their role in the world and these practices. I guess that's what I'm trying to get across with this fermentation stuff. Speaking of the social dimension, this is at the Radical uh, Mycology Convergence in Oregon, 2018. And this was uh, before I had any idea about doing the book actually, but it really kicked off the process because it was a more concentrated example of like people obviously looking into mushrooms and fungi for, you know, out of scientific interest as naturalists. Here is um, the Mycoflora Project, I believe is what it was called, uh, North American Mycoflora Project. That's right, predecessor to Fundus. Um, was there. And, and so this kind of link between citizen science and capital S science was, was at play. Um, but there was a social dimension that was really prominent and preeminent, like games, artwork, poetry. Um, the idea was to generate a microculture. That's literally what they're, they're talking about there, like a community and culture, which takes fungi as a uh, you know, the, the gathering point, the reason for convening, but then ends up talking about other, you know, much broader issues. And um, that's Peter McCoy on the left, who's sort of the, the, the uh, representative to most people of, of radical mycology. He's one of the founding members. Um, and this is a game involving red jello. I can't remember how it was played, but um, yeah, it's not something you might expect to see at a mushroom festival usually. And another artist conch growing out of a birch face. Um, there's another um, patch. You guys have some competition for the, the cool patches. Uh, that's from Marfa Mycological Society, which I think I included in here just because to me, it's funny that these, these societies are popping up all over the world and in unexpected places or all over the country, I should say. Um, and here it is, we found Mycotopia. So I guess I can just cut it now. I'm just kidding. Uh, Mycotopia is not my uh, term. I didn't invent it. This is Mushroom Mountain, Trad Cotter. Um, it's it's the it's like a, a mushroom amusement park, or it's kind of like a mushroom Willy Wonka factory. These are beer coolers filled with substrate, and there's Trad on the right. It's also a little Jurassic Park ish, I guess, because <laughs> they are working with you know certain pathogens. They they do a lot of experimentation. They grow mushrooms there. It's a mushroom farm, but they also uh, study them and, and try to experiment with different ways to utilize them in, again, breaking down contaminants. People mail trad all sorts of strange things with mushrooms growing out of them, like bowling balls. You know, the idea being that if someone sends them a bowling ball and the mushroom growing out of it, maybe they can cultivate that mushroom and then use it to break down more bowling balls. So um, that is just kind of an ominous looking <laughs> space. It looks, looks like they're working with dangerous things. One of the cool um, ideas that Trad had was to uh, kind of do a patient-specific enzyme uh, creation process with with uh, 
with fungi. So like if you are cultivating this, I don't know what strain of or species of mushroom it is, but one that is known to produce an antibacterial exudate. And then you introduce a bacterium taken from a sick patient into the, the substrate, it will produce those exudates to fight that bacteria. This is the theory at least. And then you can utilize those exudates to treat the patient. I don't know what the state of testing is on this, but it gives you a sense of some of the ideas that are emerging around how to work with fungi in, in you know, kind of applied productive ways. This is also just a cool example of mushroom farming. Um, each of the bags is perforated where it meets, where it touches the next bag. So all of the mycelium between them is connected and it's basically a wall of a single fungal organism and they all fruit in a coordinated uh, fashion. And I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, more quote unquote spent blocks. As you can see, they are anything but spent. Lots of mushrooms popping out of them. Um, again, lots of mushrooms popping out there. Those are shiitake on the mushroom walk that they have at Mushroom Mountain. Um, I may have mentioned it's in Pickens County, Tennessee. Um, and on the right, you'll see cordyceps infected ant uh, on that tag there. And you can't really see the ant, so I zoomed in. And there's a little forked stroma coming out of its head is the, is the fungus, um, the reproductive, the, 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 the fruiting body of the fungus. Um, I'm sure none of you need to be introduced to the many wonders of cordyceps and how they uh, kill bugs, turn them into little walking distribution chamber uh, units, and then, you know, pop up like that out of the death or out of, you know, their back like that ant while they're clinging to a tree. This is another uh, cordyceps entirely in another place. This is in Pennsylvania. Those are the hands of uh, William Padilla Brown finding a cordyceps on our first, the first cordyceps of our, um, our hunt for them that day as part of MycoFest, which is his uh, festival that he's kind of the, the head organizer of. Um, and this is what was called a pheno hunt. We were out looking for cordyceps growing in the wild. He and his friends uh, will take them home, sequence them, cultivate them. They are among the first to, and these are other mushrooms that were found around there, they were the first to, um, actually I'll go back just while I talk about this, to cultivate cordyceps domestically here in the United States. And they, they did it by kind of uh, decoding uh, and just trawling through like videos from Taiwan and uh, you know, other parts of the world where, where people are cultivating these mushrooms, but um, aren't necessarily writing books about it. And so William wrote a book about how to cultivate it. And again, there's a value dimension to this, um, his idea and, and his, his broader project, I, I, I could summarize as something like uh, di uh, distributing economic activity uh, at a local level, la trying to, to create um, the means for people to start their own mushroom business. He's working a lot with like spirulina and algae as a, as a, as a means of like these kind of social permaculture projects, as he puts it, to like build reciprocal sustainable cycles into communities at a local level. For him, Cordyceps was a way into that. Um, and so he, he writes this book on cultivating them. And, it, and now around the country, you, people are growing Cordyceps, you know, all over the place. And, and there's an economy emerging around them, a domestic economy. So his theory seems to work. At least uh, people are gathering around this. I, I liked that the, the tents kind of look like mushrooms. But they are, they're coming together to discuss the, the ways that fungi might become partners and moving toward the sort of world they, and, um, you know, often I agree, I would like to see, which is more locally, uh, you know, rooted, more sustainable and reciprocal, kind of like fungi themselves. And here's a panel discussion. You can see Trad, Olga on the right, there, um, there's William. And on the far left, you got Ryan Paul Gates, who's, uh, who's doing incredible work cultivating um, Ganoderma making like sculptures with them. And he's also a cultivator of cordyceps. Um, so there's real activity forming around here. That's one of uh, Ryan's sculptures, by the way. Just uh, amazing stuff. I hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, and, you know, again, to the point of making a contribution despite not being a scientist. I mean, William is a, he calls himself a graduate of Google Scholar. And he didn't go to college. You know, he's not a trained biologist in the formal sense, but he's doing real work and making real contributions that um, 
you know, you can't deny. And, and to me, it's really encouraging to think that just with passion and, uh, you know, commitment, you know, you can, you can change, you can create an economy, <laughs> you know, a local economy, you can make a contribution to, to a, a natural science. And um, mycology being such a new science, I think is ripe for that sort of engagement. And hopefully, hopefully a lot of people take up the, the call to, to make contributions. It's just amazing to me that mushrooms can look like that. Those are cordyceps growing uh, in his basement uh, lab. Um, and so we're starting to move kind of toward the close here, uh, you know, really getting explicit about the value system stuff. Uh, that's pretty clear, I think. Myceliate the state, you know, people uh, I think are taking mushrooms up as cause to have conversations about much wider you know, issues, um, much broader issues. And, and it kind of makes sense, you know, if you're, if you're looking for mushrooms and you've got to look for certain trees and you got to look at the condition of the soil and the, the health of the forest in general, and you got to think about what conditions maybe led to the condition, the, the, the health of the forest being where it's at, or what policies led to the condition of the forest being where it's at and what created those policies, who made those policies, what interests were behind them. It's not many steps between looking for mushrooms and, you know, looking for your congressman's phone number um, to uh, uh, end up with something like this. You know, we're at a mycology summit and we're talking about capitalism, um, historical trauma, environmental racism, food security. It's all wrapped up in it. This is Mario Sabalas, by the way, of a POC fungi community. Um, and this is at the New Moon Mycology Summit in um, Thurston, New York, uh, 2019. Um, again, where I saw Mercedes give a talk under this very pavilion. And in fact, I think I may see Mercedes in this picture, but um, that's uh, Patty Kaishin, Dr. Patty Kaishin on the left, giving a, a talk on her uh, paper um, that she co-authored about the queer, mycolo the queer science of mycology and how in the, um, sorry, in the science itself, not just in like looking at schizophilum and, and fungi like that, which have all sorts of mating types and, um, you know, are boundary uh, uh, binary bending in that way. Um, also in the science itself, it's it's got some, some features and aspects that make it a little different from something like botany. It's a little more intuitive and a little less um, uh, structured in terms of like going out and trying to find mushrooms, you know, plants don't pop up overnight usually the way that, uh, mushrooms do, for example. And so there's a certain, I commend the paper to anyone who's interested in this stuff. I think it's called the uh, Science Underground, um, Dr. Patty Kaishian. I highly recommend it. Um, but overall, you know, really the point, I guess, is just that these are more diverse, younger, socially conscious uh, communities that are forming around mushrooms. And at a certain point, it's not really about the mushrooms anymore. You know, it's about the the chance to gather into, you know, for certain communities, you know, that's not always forthcoming. And so, you know, and for certain communities, mushrooms represent specific things, especially when we're talking about the uh, entheogenic, the medicinal, psychedelic, um, you know, plant medicine kind of side of things. Um, you know, there are communities that feel uh, ancestral, that have ancestral connections to these practices. And yet, as the you know decriminalization movement moves apace and as uh retreat centers treatment centers are opening up therapy is becoming and, and markets are opening up and companies are cornering them um the same you know it's likely going to be mostly like white men that benefit from that um you know as is the case under our, our kind of economic order social economic order the communities that maybe feel the ancestral connection to it that, that don't have they 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 feel like they may uh, still stand to be left out. At least that's how it was put to me at the POC fungi gathering, uh, the POC fungi community gathering. Here it is um, in uh, San Diego or unceded Kumeye territory um, as one would often hear. Um, and this was like just where it was explicit and it was not hidden at all. Like this was an opportunity to gather for this community to discuss its priorities, how it wants to um, move forward with fungi and also with, you know, uh, just its community. It's, it's a, it's almost like fungi were the cause for the gathering, but not the reason for it. Um, and here you can see there's, there's that intimate braiding of 
social issues with fungi, like decolonize, you know, um, no system but the ecosystem, all stuff that I resonate with, but um, you wouldn't have to necessarily expect to uh, see it at a mushroom gathering. Um, but again, it's not really a mushroom gathering. Um, it's more than that. And here, uh, again, the cordyceps making a, an appearance. This was uh, made by Snea Ganguly. And I believe that the paper there is mushroom as well. So um, fungal biomaterial there. Um, the, uh, yeah, and so, you know, talking about like the medicinal side of things, whether these communities will be able to really partake in the boon, the economic boon, the mainstreaming, do, you know, whether all of that's really going to redound to the benefit of this community or communities like this versus the same communities that always benefit from new economic activity, which, um, you know, is likely. Um, issues like environmental remediation, if you're talking to a community of people uh, you know, the term environmental racism was raised earlier. If you're a member of a community of color, you are more likely statistically to be near a source of contamination. Um, it's a known issue. And so in that light, talking about micro remediation takes on a different, you know, character and it, it, it's a different kind of conversation. Um, so all that, I guess, is to say that you can't really disentangle the the social stuff uh, from anything that we talk about but fungi seem to really bring it to the surface in a certain way and and that's ultimately what i was really moved most by in in these um, visits and in my reporting um and so we're going to close here in ecuador where uh i got to see the results of texaco slash uh, chevron's contamination of the um rainforest uh in the areas around sucumbios um, a poor province uh, near the uh, border with Colombia. That's just gas, natural gas. Instead of refining it, they just light it on fire. Over 300 of these, they call them macheros, um, uh, lighters. Uh, they just spew toxic gas into the air. Um, oil, they said that they, the company has said that it's cleaned it up, but you can see, and you can touch it, you can smell it. Um, that pole goes all the way to the bottom of this, uh, they call it a piscina, it's just a pool of oil. Um, but in that context, you still have mushrooms growing and there's a team of people down there working with local communities trying to work out how can we work with mushrooms to clean up this oil spill. Lexi Gropper was one of them, but she ended up moving there full time. She got married uh, to Luis who she met there and She's still working in the area and, and is still engaged with these issues. But instead of trying to like find the mushrooms that'll clean up the oil spill, she's working on a sort of social remediation, which to me was a great example of kind of where this all leads, which is like thinking beyond fungi, thinking beyond mushrooms and um, kind of taking what we learn in the process of becoming fascinated with them and, and, and moving forward with, those, with the, that information and also the values of, again, reciprocity, symbiosis, um, making a waste um, and also supporting the communities of which we're part and which in turn support us, whether we're talking about ecological or social. Um, and so here are the medicinal mushrooms that they, they extract over there, but they're only for the cancer patients of the, uh, you know, the local hospitals, which there are many more cases of cancer and other ailments uh, as a result of the contamination. And so um, they won't sell these to anyone else. Um, Lexi told me that enough has been extracted from Ecuador instead of trying to like find the right mushrooms to, and I'm being I'm really oversimplifying the process, but just to be simple about it, to find the right mushrooms to help clean up the oil spills instead of doing that. And instead of trying to like kickstart a mushroom business in the area, you know, for the economic value it might generate, she's part of this project to reconnect people with the soil, um, really getting down to the basics. Um, learning how to identify what good soil looks like, which in that area is not something a lot of people are familiar with because we're talking about since the 60s, you know, the contamination of that land has made it very bad for farming. Um, so she is engaged in this, again, I call it kind of a social permaculture uh, or a social remediation, I should say, where starting by introducing people to the ground on which they stand and how to assess its health and some simple methods for starting to work it back into biological, you know, activity and health. Um, there's like a passport system so people can tour different farms and, and kind of learn different skills and match their 
the value systems, they call it the, the Cosmovision chart. You can see that rainbow chart in the, the corner there. They're really explicit about this stuff. And the whole idea is to engage the community in the effort rather than trying to descend with the technological fix, you know, the mushroom that's going to clean up the oil spill, as I keep putting it. And to me, that's sort of the answer to this whole, like, will mushrooms save the world? Can mushrooms save the world? It like really depends on what we mean by that. Um, the mushrooms will almost certainly be fine, no matter what we do um, in some sense or another uh, to the planet, to one another. They've been around for over a billion years and they'll be along. They'll, they'll be fine once we're gone. Um, so we're really what we're asking is if they can save it for us. And that's a different question, isn't it? That's really up to us. And so I hope that we will take you know, the message, the many messages the mushrooms are, are giving us intentionally or otherwise, and, uh, you know, make the decision to kind of save ourselves and, you know, in the process, save everyone else uh, along with us. Um, that's not usually how I land that. I could have been a little more <laughs> uh, elegant with that close, but that's it. And I thank you all for your time. And I hope, uh, I hope that all made sense. Oh, thanks, Doug. That was wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to stop the share there. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Doug. I hope I didn't go over time. I think you're okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if anyone has any questions for you. I know I do, but I'll... I'll wait for a minute there. And it's really fun to see uh, all these, these photos. Like you said, your book uh, is photoless. So it's, that's quite the treat. And thanks for the shout out towards the beginning there. Um, okay. Azim Sola, my friend is asking uh, about if you have a favorite mushroom and favorite forest you visited. Favorite mushroom and favorite forest. My favorite mushroom, this is a little, a little boring, I think, but I, I'm, I'm just really taken by Rishi. And I think that that's because it was the first one that I kind of grew in, you know, my space, uh, you know, kind of developed a personal relationship to it that way. It's also just beautiful. And of course, has a lot of medicinal you know, value and uh, traditional use. So it's got a lot of like kind of human uh, entanglement, <laughs> I should say, or social entanglement. And and I, that kind of gets at the root of what, uh, or the mycelium of what I find interesting about all this. As for the forests, I mean, I haven't been. In, I I feel like I I really am not even equipped to to start comparing them. Um, I I've fallen in love with the forests around here in the Hudson Valley. Um, even though it's all like second growth, um, even third. And yet yeah, it's magical and fungally just, you know, hyper diverse. And it's the one I know the best at this point. So I'd have to say my my current uh, context at the Hudson Valley. Although I will say the, the mountains around Telluride were just incredible. Um, like it, the, the only reason they might come in second is because it was almost like being in a postcard or something. You know, it almost didn't feel like an actual forest. Thank you. I'll throw in a question. Um, so I know that Chelsea Green Publishing had suggested that you propose a book to them. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what led to your decision for such an undertaking, um, especially like as um, you, you, highlight in your book these more fringy micro communities um i'm curious like uh how did you feel like or it did you feel like you could effectively highlight these um often you know smaller often more anti-capitalist anti-imperialist etc more diverse uh communities well you and know it's in, oh go ahead Oh, I was just going to say like, and, and the, and endeavors that are, um, yeah, more socially driven potentially. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, there's a lot I could say about all that. I think, I mean, to, to just as far as like the, 
writing of the book and, and how that all came about, I'll say that like, yeah, it was, it was a, a real, like, uh, I'm never going to forget getting the email from the editor, you know, saying like, Hey, I've read a couple of these articles you've written. And I think there's a, a potential book here. Do you agree? And I said, yes, I agree. <laughs> there's definitely a book in it. Um, I had thought maybe I'd write a book about this stuff or that there was a book in it, but the publishing like process is, I, this is my first book and I didn't really have the intention to, to start banging my head against that wall because that's what it's like for a lot of authors to try to get a book published. It's, it's a real slog. So crazy um, opportunity just kind of thrown at me. And it came at a time when I was really starting to kind of think about the synthesis of the stuff that you, you mentioned in uh, the other part of it, which is like, yeah, the, the connection to social issues, the, the values that I kept kind of, you know, alluding to and, um, you know, whether I was equipped to do it or not uh, is, I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> um, it to me was a really like evocative combination of things like fungi, the whole thing about fungi just being really, you know, I mean, while I was working on the book, uh, Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake came out and that was like a real deep dive into the fungi themselves. And, and he, he, it's a great book. He un unpacks a lot of the stuff that um, I would have gotten to if I were a biologist or if I were equipped to talk about that stuff. But as a journalist, as someone who just like parachutes into situations where I don't belong and learns about people. And in this case, I feel like I kind of came to belong, which, which added a dimension to it. Like I've, I've really felt embraced by this community before the book, after, during and after the book. Um, it's a very welcoming and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of dimensions to every kind of community, but um it, it was unique as a journalist to be so involved and engaged and interested and also responsible for like representing it. Um, I didn't, I wasn't out to like muckrake or, you know, burn anybody or like, you know, this isn't a book that tries to speak truth to power or anything, but I did feel like the narrative about like saving the world and about, and a lot of the kind of like energy around mushrooms and those generating the interest around it was, was like ringing a certain alarm bell in my head that I it was reminding me of when I used to write about technology and, and media a lot more because it's a lot of this kind of solutionist uh, discourse, you know, that like there's an app for that, you know, we'll fix it with the blockchain. We'll uh, you know, you, you name it. Like there's always something that someone's trying to sell you to uh, fix the problem. When the thing about mushrooms that, that I came to like, and I couldn't have articulated this in the beginning, but I came to understand it. Like to me, they, they were a rare opportunity to like draw your attention into something that had all this promise and was super fascinating and fun and all these great characters around. It was just good like material, but then it also brought you past all that to see, let's consider our relationship with nature. Let's consider our relationship to one another and how those can inform one another and how fungi's example might be useful to us beyond just like, oh, they can break this down or they can produce this thing or, you know, they can be plugged in this way. There's a, just plug a mushroom into the problem thing. Actually, it starts to like uh, challenge our, our, our preconceptions about like, again, like binaries about in inter individuality and, and um, you know, the, uh, reveals to us the interdependence of everything. And so um, it was just rich, you know, as a subject in all of that stuff. Um, all of that said, you know, it's a book about diversity. It's a book about um, equity, you know, and, and I mean, it's not about those things, but those themes are very heavy in it. And I was very conscious of like my demographics, you know, as the person writing it, it could have been like, I mean, I've talked to people who were like, you know, you could, you should have just said like, give it to, give it to some, give it to a woman of color to write, you know, <laughs> like people have suggested that to me. I think it's a valid thing to say. I don't know anybody else that was on the precipice of writing this book um, or who would have written the book that I was trying to write. So I don't know who I would have passed it off to, but I definitely take that critique on board. Um, a bunch of white dudes writing books about mushrooms, you know, I'm one of them. So I can't, you know, deny that. Um, but, you know, my, my hope is, is that it boosts the signal of people who's doing work that I think is, promising, fascinating, and insightful and informative. And, you know, I don't really come to any conclusions myself in the book. I think I ask some questions and I hope that it inspires people to like take their own steps down their own respective paths 
So that's sort of how I conceived of it. It was like as a, a signal boost, I trusted my own like sense of who was doing work that was you know, interesting and kind of like allude to things, maybe not say them explicitly all the time, but um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question. I could probably write a book about writing the book. <laughs> No, that's great. I really appreciate that. And I think that uh, just self-awareness is, is crucial. And um, I believe you certainly, yeah, get highlight um, and give that signal boost uh, to a lot of very amazing um, initiatives right now. And so it's great to see uh, this book getting getting quite a bit of attention. And I hope that uh, that does something to elevate um, the, these other initiatives um, and that within itself at least like is, is really huge. So yeah, um, let's see. Oh, okay. We are going a little over time, but I think it's okay. Um, I have one, I have another question here from uh, my coworker, Jake Tracy, who asks, uh, <laughs> if you were in your 20s and knew you had the wisdom of Trad Cotter behind you, what kind of mushroom business would you try to start? And also please say hi to Trad for me, phenomenal guy. <laughs> First of all, what makes you think I'm not in my 20s? <laughs> Second of all, um, the uh, uh what would i let me make sure i got that right yeah. if i were in my 20s which i'm not uh and i were starting a mushroom business with the wisdom of trad cotter behind me is that what he said they yes said? Yeah, yeah i would ask trad to do it and <laughs> i would like find a way to finance it or something <laughs> but that, like the, honestly the guy like the ideas just fall out of his pockets. It's crazy. He's like, I, I had to leave a lot of stuff out that was just, and stuff he, he wouldn't let me share. I also like technology that he has in that farm. That's like custom built and just like all of that adding efficiencies and stuff. So I, I think if, if I were to do that and I had, a, and all of those things were the case, it would be the most efficient mushroom farm in existence. Probably <laughs> it's like, he's got a, I, I mentioned it in the book, like a, a, a sterilizer, that's also a substrate mixer. So you can like sterilize the substrate and just toss, toss the spawn in and then it'll like pour it into bags for you. So it's just like one, one stop. You don't need an autoclave or anything like that. He had it built. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, would, I would just say, try to find Trad and ask him, get as much information from him as you can. I've never seen anyone with that kind of like tinkerer's mindset. For sure. Uh, Mountain Dude asks, where can we buy the book? Good question. Poor um, Richard. What's that? Poor Richards. I bought a copy at Poor Richards Bookstore in Colorado Springs. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say, if there are any local independent bookstores, that would be the first um, place I would hope you go. I don't know the scene around there, but um, there's... Uh, bookshop.org i think it's is available it, it's available it, basically anywhere you find a, you know your books you can find it i would just always put amazon last on the list but of course it's available there um there's an audio book too but um yeah the local bookstores we gotta we gotta support them yeah thank you brian for noting that poor richards is great in downtown colorado springs um i know that you can you can uh, rent the book from the Pikes Peak Library District. So that's great. And yeah, you got those online resources as well. Um, let's see. Wherever okay. fun books are sold. I, they... um, as I finish it, at the club library. So it'll always be in our club library. Thank you, Doug. That was oh, that's an awesome. Awesome talk. Uh, I, I know we've gone way long over, but wow, that Sorry. was <laughs> got to know you're always welcome out here and thank you mercedes for hooking us up with what a great speaker so thank you all that was awesome i'm gonna close off and run and hide myself Bye. <laughs> thanks for indulging yeah thank you all for joining us um 
I, I do have another question, but I think we'll just wrap it up here. Though I do want to know where I can get one of those I want to believe posters. Yeah, it's really can, amazing. I can tell you where to get them. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, but not off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay I, ha- cool. I have the link. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, looks like, yeah, that concludes the questions on the YouTube channel. And again, uh, this will be going up on the, our page on YouTube in case anyone missed it. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate you spending time with us. I know that you've been doing a good few, um, presentations on your book. Um, so thanks for doing another run through on that. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully in just a few months here. Yeah. Hit me up. Will do. And thanks for the opportunity. This was fun. Absolutely. Talk to you next time. Till next time. (laughs) All right. Take care.